Hello, everyone, and welcome to our ENDO 2023 Hormones and Technology News Conference. We're really happy that you're all here today. My name is Colleen Williams, and I'm the Senior Manager of Communications at the Endocrine Society. Today's news conference will focus on the latest research on hormones and technology. And we're really pleased to have with us today Arvinder Dalla of Rani Therapeutics in San Jose, California, Victoria Oaks of Indiana University School of Medicine, and Amanda Godoy of Cardiff University in the UK. Over the next 30 minutes, each speaker will present their findings, and we will end with a Q&A session. Please note that this news conference is being broadcast live via webcast, and that there are many journalists online with us right now. Because we are broadcasting live via the web, it's important for all remarks to be made into a microphone. Journalists who are attending online will be able to type their questions into the chat at any point during the news conference, and we'll address those at the end during the Q&A. I would now like to invite our first presenter, Dr. Dalla, to speak. Thank you. Colleen and Jenny and the organizers for the opportunity to showcase our work here at ENDO. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Arvinder Dalla, and I'm from Rani Therapeutics. So where do we get the slides? Out? I'm delighted to be here to present, uh, to share with you the data from our phase one study, which evaluated the PK of parathyroid hormone administered orally via the Rani pill capsule called RT102. This is a simple phase one study, but what is really exciting and special about this study is the technology that we have used to administer the drug uh, which can be delivered orally. So a little bit about the technology. Rani pill capsule is an oral drug delivery platform which can deliver a number of biologics orally. Biologics are the drugs that can be taken only by injections. And in fact, they're painful injections. And it should come as no surprise to anyone that patients do not like taking injections. We have, delivered, uh, we have developed this technology which can replace these painful injections and we can deliver biologics via the Rani pill capsule. The current study that, uh, that we are, I'm going to talk about is Rani pill containing PTH-134 and it's also called RT-102. PTH-134 or also sold under the brand name Forteo is approved as a sub-Q injection for the treatment of osteoporosis. So can you imagine taking a sub-Q injection daily for up to two years for this, uh, for this treatment of osteoporosis? And what if you could take this drug, the same drug, orally? Would that not make life of millions of people very easy? So what I'm going to show you uh, in the next 10 minutes or so, that this same drug delivered via the Rani pill had a bioavailability similar to or actually higher than a sub-Q injection, and the, the drug was delivered with high reliability, and the uh, RT-102 was safe and well-tolerated by all participants. Now, before we dive into the uh, details of the study and the data, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the Rani pill. Uh, and I'm going to share with you uh, this short video that will show you how the technology works. Here you see a patient swallowing what appears to be a standard capsule. The capsule has a special enteric coating that protects it from the acidic environment in the stomach. When the capsule encounters the higher pH levels found in the small intestine, the enteric coating and outer shell of the capsule dissolve, exposing the delivery mechanism to intestinal fluid. 
The mechanism has a self-inflating balloon that contains two reactants separated by a dissolvable valve. Exposure to intestinal fluid dissolves the valve, allowing the reactants to mix, creating carbon dioxide. This inflates the balloon and creates the pressure needed to inject a dissolvable microneedle containing the drug or sensor into the intestinal wall. The intestinal injection is pain-free as the intestines have no sharp pain receptors. The balloon then deflates and is safely passed out. In the case of drug delivery, the drug is quickly absorbed by the highly vascularized intestinal wall. The Rani pill is capable of delivering a broad range of proteins, peptides, antibodies, and diagnostic sensors, making it a ubiquitous oral delivery platform. So, to date, we have preclinical and clinical data with 12 different molecules, which include hormones, peptides, and large antibodies, showing that Rani pill can deliver all these different molecules with very high bioavailability, almost equal to sub-Q injections. Here you see... Oh, sorry. So now coming back to the current study, the goal of the, of the study was to obtain PK profiles of the single doses of PTH delivered via the Rani pill in healthy participants. What we wanted to know was how effectively Rani Pell can deliver this drug. So the study was done in Australia in healthy uh, women, and the endpoints for, for the study were safety, tolerability, and then PK parameters of PTH. We tested two doses of um, PTH in the Rani Pill, uh, 20 and 80 microgram, and we also had a control group of um, uh, subjects who took Forteo, given at, sub, uh, at 20 microgram uh, in a sub-Q injection. Looking at the study demographics data, you can see that the three groups were fairly well balanced in terms of age, height, weight, BMI, and there were no significant differences between the three groups. Looking at the safety and tolerability of RT102, it was a fairly, there were uh, very few, just a handful of um, uh, adverse events in the study. As you can see, in the 20 microgram group, there were no adverse events. In the 80 microgram group, just a couple, and which were actually fewer than the 20 microgram dose of Forteo given via the sub-Q injection. More importantly, what, what is, uh, noted here that there were no Rani pill related adverse events in any of the groups. Next, we're gonna look at the device performance. So how effectively or how reliably the, the device performed, or in other words, what we call it successful drug delivery. And this was assessed by the presence of drug levels in blood samples. We tested two different versions of the Rani pill, version C and version D. Version C we have tested in a previous phase one study, and version D is a slightly different but improved version of, um, uh, from version C. And as you can see, um, the current version, the new improved version, gave us a 95% uh, reliability or success rate for drug delivery. So we're quite pleased with these data that Ranipil can effectively and reliably deliver the drug. So now let's look at how much drug was uh, delivered by the Rani pill. And now we're gonna look at the PK profiles of PTH delivered via the Rani pill as well as the sub-Q injection. Data in the black um, is of Forteo uh, delivered via the sub-Q injection at 20 microgram dose. And the curve is similar to what has been published in the literature. Data in blue is of PTH delivered via the Rani pill at 20 microgram dose. The Cmax is a little bit lower, but it is more sustained, which resulted in higher AUC. And in fact, it was about threefold higher compared to the sub-Q injection. The 80 microgram dose, as expected, the Cmax was much higher compared to the sub-Q as well as the 20 microgram RT102 dose. And it's, this also resulted in an AUC of about fourfold higher compared to the sub-Q injection. So what I've shown you here is that Rani Pill can deliver 
PTH, the same drug that can be taken by a sub-Q injection, actually more effectively than a sub-Q injection. Now, in case you're wondering why did we do the 80 microgram dose, there is another drug uh, called Timlose, which is another analog of PTH, uh, also approved for the treatment of osteoporosis, um, is delivered at or is approved at 80 microgram dose. So the graph on the right is the PK taken from the literature of abaloperatide um, at 80 microgram dose in healthy volunteers. And the graph on the left is actually our data, the RT102 data that I just showed you in the previous slide at the 80 microgram dose, plotted differently to match the x-axis of the right graph. So you can see here that the PK of PTH delivered via the Rani pill at 80 microgram dose matches exactly with the PK of Timlose or abaloparatide taken or given at 80 microgram dose. In phase three studies, it has been shown that Timlose is more efficacious for bone growth markers over Forteo, and we believe that PTH delivered via the Rani pill at 80 microgram dose can result in better bone growth uh, compared to both Forteo as well as Timlose. So we are currently planning a phase two study to determine the efficacy of um, PTH delivered via the Rani pill. But in the meantime, we conducted a preclinical uh, study in a rat model of osteoporosis to understand or to evaluate the, the efficacy of uh, PTH. Um, it's the same drug substance that is incorporated into the Rani pill in RT102. So what we did was that, that these rats, which were overectomized to develop osteoporosis, they were given um, treatment for six weeks, and we compared three doses of RT102 along with both uh, two reference controls, teriparatide as well as abaloparatide, which were given via the sub-Q route. And what we looked at was the changes in BMD following six weeks of treatment. And the data showed that PTH delivered via IP injection, which mimics the Rani pill route of in, uh, delivery, increased BMD similar to the referen reference controls at similar doses. And the, uh, the reference controls also yielded predictable increases in BMD consistent with the literature, what has been already shown. Um, we have a poster this afternoon on this study, so if you uh, need more details regarding this study, you can come to the poster. It's abstract number 6821, as shown here. Now to wrap up, what I've shown you is a new way to deliver biologics orally. Data from our phase one study has shown that PTH can be delivered via the Rani pill at a bioavailability similar to or higher than sub-Q injection. To our knowledge, this is the first study showing oral delivery of PTH with such bi high bioavailability. You may know that patients and physicians, they wait to start for TAO treatment because patients do not like to take injections. So we believe that having an oral option as an RT-102 for the patients, they, this could lead to a wide acceptance of this therapy earlier in the disease progression where it has the greatest impact. And the Rani pill is not just for PTH. It, it can deliver a wide variety of biologics, as I mentioned before. And we believe that uh, the delivery of biologics, different biologics, via Rani pill, because we can deliver at very high bioavailability similar to sub-Q injection, we can change um, the lives of millions of patients who are taking biologics um, as sub-Q injections, which are very painful. So our goal is to convert those biologics into oral pills with Rani pill technology. Thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions after the other speakers go. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dalla. I'd now like to invite Dr. Oaks to speak.
Thanks, Colleen, for the introduction, and thanks, Indo2023, uh, for having me. Um, the Ronnie pill, that sounds really cool. <laughs> um, so um, in this month, in 1999, the FDA approved the first continuous glucose monitor. Now, nearly 25 years later, continuous glucose monitors, or CGMs, have revolutionized the way we look at diabetes management. Hi, my name is Tori Oaks. I am a third year medical student at Indiana University School of Medicine. And with the help um, from my colleagues at Reilly Children's Hospital in Indianapolis, we looked at CGM alarm use um, by families of children with diabetes. Here are our relevant disclosures. CGMs offer a variety of customizable alarms. You can set an alarm, such as the low alarm, and you can also choose what that threshold threshold is. For example, if the low alarm goes off at 80 or if it goes off at 70 milligrams per deciliter. These alarms um, alert people with diabetes and their caregivers of pending glycemic changes. However, little work has been done studying real-world CGM alarm settings in pediatric clinical populations. So the objective of our study was to understand CGM alarm use um, through reports by looking at CGM alarm settings compared to recommended and also CGM alarm settings in comparison to different groups. The first thing um, we considered is we included children with all types of diabetes in the study, and then we looked at children who were only using the Dexcom G6 CGM specifically. We obtained two-week clinical report downloads when patients arrived to an outpatient center for their outpatient diabetes appointment. We uploaded their data, and that's how we um, got their real-time alert settings. And we ended up, the study, having 150 patients with the following demographics. The median age was 14, uh, median A1C was 7.8, and the average time and range, so that would be between um, 70 and 180 milligrams per deciliter, was 47%. So the first thing we looked at is just what alarms is our sample using. So the most popular alarm is the low alarm, which was used by 131 of the 150 participants. Um, the other two most popular alarms were the urgent low soon and the urgent low repeat alarms, which were used both by more than 80% of the sample. Um, two other popular alarms were the high alarm and the signal loss alarm. Um, high alarm used by 109 participants, signal loss used by 103. Um, the least popular alarms were the rise rate alarm, the fall rate alarm, and the high repeat alarm. All of these were used by less than a quarter of our participants. So not a ton of data um, exists on the recommendations for CGM alarm settings. However, we did find um, the Panther program out of Barbara Davis Center for Diabetes, and that is what we used as our recommendations to compare to our sample. And we found that our sample had significantly different cutoffs from all of the Panther program recommendations. For example, they recommended a high alarm threshold of 250. However, our patients set alarms um, from anywhere for a threshold of 120 all the way up to 400. The low alarm threshold they recommend was 70. Our patients used anywhere from 60 all the way to 100. And lastly, they recommended a high alarm repeat time of two hours, and our uh, participants used anywhere from 15 minutes to three hours. We also concluded that pump users are more likely to use some alarms than injection users. For example, they're more likely to use the high repeat and the low repeat alarms. We also found that younger children, specifically those 12 and under, are more likely to use a majority of the available alarms than older patients. Um, the most notable being the rise rate, which younger children were 3.6 times more likely to use this alarm. So in conclusion, patients with diabetes are employing a large number of CGM alarm settings. Um, notably, pump users and younger patients are more likely to be using these customizable alarms. And the next step for this research would be to look at education. So now that we know how people are using their alarms, how can we put this into practice and help um, the diabetes care team optimize these alarm settings? And I think it's really important <clears throat> when we have this conversation to 
help support patients and set up their alarm best practices while also knowing um, the limited amount of time that providers have to spend with patients. Thank you so much for your time. I'm happy to take any questions after. I'd now like to invite our last speaker to present. Good morning, everyone, uh, and thank you to the organizers and to the society for inviting us to share our work. My name is Amanda Godoy, and I'm a medical student from Brazil, but I'm currently in Cardiff University in the United Kingdom. And it's a great pleasure to be presenting today on behalf of all of my co-authors presenting on the screen who are from multiple institutions all around the world. And today I'll be presenting on our meta-analysis of randomized control trials exploring the effectiveness of closed-loop insulin delivery compared to usual care in children with type 1 diabetes. So just off note, we do not have any financial disclosures or conflict of interest to declare. And some of the highlights of our meta-analysis to already grab your attention is that we pulled 12 randomized control studies together comprising of 993 patients with uh, pediatric patients with type 1 diabetes. And we found that the prolonged use of closed loop systems significantly improved glycated hemoglobin, time in range, and nocturnal hypoglycemia. And we found no differences in the rate of adverse events and overall hypoglycemia between groups. But I'll explore more of that throughout the presentation. A little bit of background before hand on this topic. Globally, it is estimated that around 1.1 million of people aged 0 to 19 years old are diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And it is a quite a significant condition. And in a simplified manner, these patients are not able to produce their own insulin to control glucose levels, and therefore they need to administer um, insulin externally through a range of devices and ther therapies in order to keep their blood levels stable. And unfortunately, a small proportion of these patients are able to achieve uh, an appropriate glycemic control. And intensive insulin therapy is the current of standard of care for these patients. So some of the devices that are commonly used and the therapies that are commonly used in those patients that are presented on the screen, the continuous glucose monitoring, the insulin pump, the multiple daily injections. And these are quite effective, but patients are still struggling with treatment satisfaction, autonomy, and being able to control their glycemic levels without um, having the risk of hypoglycemia. And several different technologies over the last few decades have explored the interaction and integration of several of these devices in order to provide more advanced technologies for these patients. One of the widely known and used um, devices by the type 1 diabetic population is the sensor augmented pump, which incorporates the insulin pumps and the CGMs, the continuum mo glucose monitoring. And these devices, they function independently, but they allow the user to manually modify the rate of insulin according to the CGM values. And we have a new category of these systems that have emerged, which are called automated insulin delivery systems. And outside of having an insulin pump and a continuous glucose monitor, they also have an algorithm which are, is able to change the level of insulin infused based on real-time CGM values. One of the first generations of these devices are called predictive low glucose pumps, and they suspend insulin when hypoglycemia is predicted. We have the latest ones as well, which are called hybrid closed loops, and they infuse and suspend insulin according to CGM values, and they still need user input. So they're providing the basal insulin, but for meals and exercise, for example, patients still need to um, have insulin boluses. We also have the fully closed loop systems, which do not need user, user input and are completely automated. The latest, the even latest generation of these devices are called bihormonal systems, which not only use insulin, but also glucagon, but we won't be addressing these today. 
Several studies and meta-analysis have reported encouraging results on the effectiveness of these devices, but these assessments have only focused on variable timing, mostly hours or days, which limits the pragmatic application of the use of closed-loop systems for these patients, which are used on the outpatient setting, where conditions are unpredictable, and these patients ha are having to continuously use these devices. So we aim to perform a systematic review and meta-analysis of only randomized trials comparing ultimate insulin delivery to usual care for children with type 1 diabetes, specifically with a minimum duration of three months. And the benefits of doing a meta-analysis for this is because the topic is quite new, and these trials have a limited participant population, which also limits the statistical power needed to detect some important clinical outcomes. And by pulling all of these, res these results together, we are able to get a greater population and higher statistical power to detect differences between groups, which can translate to meaningful clinical care. And we focused specifically on a duration of three months because we were assessing some of the lab results, specifically glycated hemoglobin, which needs a minimum amount of time in order to reflect into laboratory values. And we also wanted to provide a more pragmatic assessing, assessment, a more solid basis for the real life application of these systems. So you can see some of our inclusion criteria on the screen. We included studies uh, on children with type 1 diabetes, exploring hybrid and fully closed loop systems, so the latest generation of these devices, compared to usual care, which we consider to be multiple daily injections, sensor augmented pump, predictive low glucose systems, and continuous glucose monitoring. And we only included, as I mentioned, studies with over 12 weeks of duration. And after searching for different databases, PubMed, Embase, Cochrane, and clinical trials, we were able to exclude the, re the irrelevant studies and were able to find 12 randomized controlled trials which were eligible for analysis. In total, we had around nine, we, we had a total of 993 children aged 2 to 12, 17 years old. And the range of duration of these studies were from 12 to 96 weeks. And a range of systems were used, including the Florence, the, um, the Minimed machines. But most of them were hybrid closed loops, those that needed the user input. We only had one study that used the fully closed loop systems because only um, the, some, some studies and some machines are being um, authorized and uh, marketed at this point. So coming to our results, um, as you can see in this forest plot, we, by pulling all of the results together, we can see that closed loops significantly improved the time and range for these patients, which increased by 10.99% compared to usual care. And similarly, we found a significantly improved glycated hemoglobin level for closed loop users, which decreased by 0.37% compared to usual care. And we found no differences in the range, the percentage of time below the range in the hypoglycemic region, more specifically less than 70 milligrams per deciliter, which differed from previous results of shorter term, like uh, shorter term meta-analysis and trials which were explored in these patients. And this slide summarizes the, the findings of our study compared to the glycemic targets of the type 1 diabetic population. In bold, you can see that we found our significant results. And in not, the, the ones not in bold are, are non-significant. So we found a decreased time in range, um, a significant increased time in range, and a decreased time in the hyperglycemic region, both in 180 and 250 milligrams per deciliter. And we also find a decreased um, nocturnal hypoglycemia in these patients as well, less than 70 milligrams per deciliter. But we found no differences in the glucose variability in the hypoglycemic region, less than 54 and less than 70 milligrams per deciliter, and also in the rate of adverse events, more specifically diabetic ketoacidosis and severe hypoglycemia. And after conducting some uh, other analysis, more specifically meta-regressions, we found that our results were consistent regardless of the baseline glycated hemoglobin of patients and the follow-up duration of these studies. And reassuringly, we found no evidence of publication bias, which increases the certainty of our findings. It is also important to mention some of the limitations of our study. We found some high degree of heterogeneity in some of our analysis, but we were able to account for that by conducting subgroup analysis specified by the type of machine, and we were able to see that the heterogeneity decreased significantly, and our results were mostly consistent. 
the, we still have the question about hypoglycemia because we found no difference in the rates of hypoglycemia in our um, study between groups. And we, we speculate that this is because a high proportion of randomized trials in our study have reported machine errors in the longer duration of these trials, which potentially have important implications for type 1 diabetic patients. And managing type 1 diabetes in children is particularly difficult because of the challenges associated with normal childhood development, including less predictable food intake and activity levels, which can have significant impacts for these patients. And the higher cost of these devices, the pump glitches and the machine errors have been previously perceived as drawbacks by the type 1 diabetic population. And more improvements toward the fully closed loop systems, which do not need um, user input because most of our studies that we included were hybrid closed closed loops, and including more bihormonal um, systems, studies that, uh, uh, that study the bihormonal effects of these systems, can also provide a better glucose control and a significant treatment satisfaction for these patients. So in summary, this was the first meta-analysis, including patients and in trials with over 12 weeks of duration. And our findi findings significantly um, augment the certainty of the beneficial effects of closed-loop systems in, um, in insulin delivery. And we speculate that these findings also have important implications for future randomized trials exploring the effects of bihormonal and fully closed-loop systems that should p place a significant uh, focus on patient education and also device functioning and the type of machine used. So I would like to acknowledge the members of the research team who are part of this project, uh, specifically Dr. Eduardo Padrão and Dr. João Roberto de Sá. And also I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Randerson Cardozo from Brigham and Women's Hospital in Harvard Medical School for his methodological underpinning and continuous support throughout as well. Thank you very much for letting me present today. And if you wish to get in touch with other questions that are not covered, please uh, find, me, find my email on the slide. Thank you. Thank you all so much for the great presentations. We're going to now begin the Q&A session. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Jenny. If anyone in the room has a question. Please state your name and outlet as well. So people yes, know uh, Mike Menasher from Helio Endocrine Today. Um, I had uh, uh, two questions for Dr. Dalla on the on the robotic pill. Um, uh, first off, I know you mentioned that this could be used for other biologics. So um, this may be a little far further down the road, but would there be like additional studies to see if this is pill is just as effective with other biologics as it is in this initial data? And I guess my second question, I was just curious about the different versions, because you had a previous version on there, and then I think a version C, and then a version D. So in, I guess in layman's, layman's terms, can you kind of describe what the differences are in that? Thank you for the questions. So I'll answer the second one first. Uh, there's no significant difference between the, the two versions. We are currently... Um, going forward with the version D, obviously that gave us the higher reliability. But the difference are really minor, just manufacturing uh, processes were changed to optimize the, the performance. Going back to your first question, you know, we have conducted already a phase one study with octreotide, which is another small peptide. Uh, that study was conducted in 2019, and we got 65% bioavailability. Uh, we actually uh, had an IV arm in that study to get the absolute bioavailability of octreotide. And as I mentioned in the presentation as well, that we have data with 12 different molecules, which include PTH and octreotide, um, and actually several large antibodies, showing the bioavailability of those molecules given via the Rani pill is similar to sub-Q injection, and especially the antibodies. And to our knowledge, nobody has demonstrated that the, an antibody can be delivered orally at such high bioavailability. So we believe, and we're actually starting um, a phase one study with a ostekinumab biosimilar uh, molecule. Um, so a phase one study will be starting later this year, which will give you more data, more clinical data. I uh, <clears throat> Ed Sussman with MedPage today. Also for Dr. Dalit, just to make sure I understand, um, you, other than PTH, um, which is in clinical trials now and is mm -hmm. not approved, are any other 
Is the Ronnie pill being used anywhere for any other um, um, biologics or anything, or is this the first one? This is the second phase one study. So we do have data with two molecules in humans to show the high bioavailability. Um, no, it is not currently approved for any indication, but we are you know, starting uh, efficacy trials with Ranipil later this year. So hope to get approval in the next coming years. And a question for Dr. Oak, or Ms. Oaks, um, soon to be doctor, hopefully. Um, <laughs> Um, in, in the press release, it discusses um, confusion or um, uh, people not paying much attention to the alarms because they're misset or set wrong. Could you elaborate on that, and, uh, and you know, which I assume was the basis for the, doing the study, and could you elaborate on that? Yeah, so um, when people get the CGM, it comes with default CGM alert settings. So when, when patients are diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, when they find out they're going to have a lifelong disease, like they're getting so much information about how to manage their disease. So alerts and alarms on their CGM might not be the first thing that they're prioritizing. Um, so the kind of, what we want to do this study was just kind of highlight, you know, what alarms are people using and how can we improve how people are using their alarms and their diabetes management. Um, it, um, you know, you, uh, you in the press release it, it discusses uh, um, that they're, they're, some people are ignoring the alarms because they're misset. That's what I wanted you to exp uh, elaborate on. Okay. Um, so I guess what that part was getting at was, for example, if someone sets a high alarm at, <clears throat> let's say, 150, but their blood sugars are constantly running at 200, they're going to get alerts all the time. And so in the same way that we turn off like an alarm that's been going off for a few, hour, a few hours or like a car maintenance alarm, the same way we turn that out, that can happen. It's called alarm fatigue um, for patients. So that's why it's really important to optimize the information they're getting so they can make um, glycemic changes they need to while also not being overwhelmed and fall to this alarm fatigue. Great, we have a few questions online uh, from Marcus Banks. Uh, these are for Ms. Oaks. How are patients typically onboarded to CGM use today? Um, and he's writing for Medscape. Okay. So today, um, it's, it's a combination of the diabetes care team. So diabetes educators um, play a big role in getting patients started on their CGM. Um, so I think the next step in this research would to be really looking at what does that CGM onboarding conversation look like and what does specifically that alarm um, conversation look like. Great, thank you. For Ms. Godoy, um, I know it, sometimes it's been um, a challenge, particularly um, as we look at you know, racial and ethnic disparities to encourage diabetes technology use. Um, given your findings, what do you think about where, where does that leave us? How do we encourage more widespread use? Um, that's, that's a great question. Thank you for asking. It, it is quite challenging, and there are some important limitations for um, applying these results for different types of populations, including socioeconomic background and uh, the race as well. And unfortunately, our meta-analysis able, wasn't able to provide answers because we didn't conduct a patient-level data meta-analysis. So we weren't able to get results specifically to socioeconomic background, for example. But there are some trials that are, are being done in more diverse populations. Um, it is a limitation that most of these trials are including um, white populations with higher uh, socioeconomic backgrounds. But hopefully, these trials as well, this is pointing towards um, di designing future trials that are also able to test the efficacy of closed loop systems in, more di in a diverse range of not only uh, diabetic pa pediatric populations and different age ranges, but also different backgrounds for these patients. Great, thank you. That's all the questions we have. Again, thank you so much to all the reporters and our speakers that joined us today. 
Um, it was a really fascinating discussion. And as a reminder, um, the recordings are going to be available on our website and YouTube channel um, if anyone wants to check them out. And if you have any additional questions or want to set up an interview with one of our presenters, please contact us at media at endocrine.org. Thank you, everyone.